KSN's Motoring 95 is brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life. And Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension, and steering service, trust your car to Midas. This week, motoring is in Montreal, one of North America's most beautiful cities. I'm down in the old port area on the St. Lawrence River, and I want to show you something. You might have heard that the winters get a tad on the cool side, and they get plenty of snow here in Montreal. But hey, the temperature right now is about 20 degrees, and check this out. We're talking snow. This isn't fake. Now, I know they had a great summer here. Surely this couldn't be left over from last winter. Well, we'll investigate later on. Also, later on the program, we're going to introduce a new segment on motoring entitled Off-Road Corner. Auto journalist Cam McRae is going to give us the scoop on enjoying the off-road experience. But first, we're going to meet some people who have probably been driving off-road longer than anyone. It may look just like another pickup truck, but if you look a little closer, you'll notice this vehicle has an option you cannot find in the showroom. These trucks are known as high rail vehicles. CP Rail has been using them for the past two years and they have been a welcomed addition. Uh, well, I've been uh, with the railway since the mid-70s and uh, since that time, uh, mechanization, automation, uh, new efficiency, I guess, is. Uh, come at us uh, virtually every month, every year, and uh, this is certainly, uh, this type of uh, operation is certainly an example of that. Uh, it, uh, it speeds uh, work on the railway, it certainly makes it more flexible, more adaptable, and uh, I think safer as well, which is a bonus for uh, not only the railway business, but for the people who have to sustain it. With the old uh, motor car system, you're confined to a fairly limited stretch of track, and uh, Motor cars would have to be uh, lifted, manually lifted out of a garage or storage point, placed upon the track, uh, operated only uh, in circumstances in which there was no other rail traffic about, and driven strictly on the track to the work site. So it was much more limited and much more confined. Uh, what you can do with a high rail vehicle is uh, drive over the public road network to the uh, crossing point that's nearest to the rail point that you need to get to, uh, drive it onto the rails, uh, drop the steel railway wheels and uh, continue your journey that way. Basically, the power that drives it along the roadway also drives it along the rails. It's set up so that the uh, normal truck drive wheels are in contact with the rail tops, and that's what provides the traction and power. Most conventional vehicles are adaptable to high rail. You have to be careful about the width between the wheels. But basically, uh, with some fairly minor modifications, uh, you can adapt many vehicles to high rail use. Our newest vehicle, uh, it's called the Basic Track Maintenance Force. We bring these vehicles on board to reduce injuries and stuff like that, because working on a the railroad, there's no light things to lift, or even our tools are very heavy. Now with the BTMF vehicle, we have booms uh, equipped on them to lift the rail, which reduces the number of men we need at a location to change a rail. Say eight men now, down to four. We've got hydraulic tools for the men as well, which uh, in essence is saving a lot of back injuries and uh, any other further injuries. The productivity is a lot higher because now it's just a matter of minutes to change a rail and do other uh, little things out there in the job. The trick of it is with the BTMF vehicle is to have a long enough crossing to maneuver that truck into place. We've got the uh, steel wheels for the riding on the rail. It only takes a matter of seconds to uh, set the truck up and uh, you're on your way. The driver will use his accelerator pedal, his brake pedal, as if you're driving down the highway. The only difference is, is that he doesn't steer it when we put that truck on, any high rail vehicle that goes on the track, the steering system locks. So in other words, it's just like a train now. The guide wheels will keep it on the track. Well, myself, I'm, I drive a GM uh, product and uh, sometimes when you do get caught in the traffic, and I know how uh, 
easy it is working on the railroad and being familiar with it. I wish I was equipped with high rails sometimes to get around the traffic, especially in metropolitan towns like uh, Montreal or Toronto. You, know, you can bypass a lot of traffic very quickly. Not a safe idea. Uh, not a safe idea for somebody who's not familiar with the rules and regulations of the railroad. So if I see a Chevy someday on the railway, I'll know who it is. It could be me. <laughs> We're back in the city port area of Old Montreal. As I mentioned earlier, the temperature is a nice 20, 21 degrees Celsius. But look in front of me. They've got snow. I mean, what's going on? As we suspected, the snow cover was isolated and man-made. In fact, the Michelin Man was the star of the show. Michelin selected Montreal for the introduction of its new Alpine snow tire as the province of Quebec is North America's biggest market for snow tires. Michelin is launching today the Michelin Alpin, the new winter tire, and uh, we decided that we would have a real snowstorm or snowfall at the place where we decided to launch the tire. So we had 15 tons of ice uh, spread on, uh, on the grass and uh, here on the site. Would it not have been easier to do this in the winter time? Uh, yes, maybe easier, but during the winter time, maybe we should have waited until uh, mid-December or mid-January uh, if we uh, look back uh, to last winter. And uh, we wanted to let the consumers know before the first snowfall. What was your reaction when your marketing people said, we'll bring you snow to Montreal in 20 degrees? Uh, I lost some of my hair. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it was uh, an idea that Dominique came up with, and uh, she had to live with it. And uh, she's a hero right now because uh, the temperature went down this morning. We have a breeze from the water here, and the snow stayed, and uh, everything went fine. We're introducing the Y concept of siping, which is a concept which is revolutionary. It's uh, patented by Michelin. And the sipes are the cuts that are in the tread uh, that enable you to um, kind of grasp the ice and the snow. And this concept enables the tire to, when it's about 40% worn, to double the sipes on the tire. So therefore, if you start out with a tread uh, block that has four sipes, when it's 40% worn, you've got eight sipes. That gives you more edge to bite into the, the snow and on the ice. I suppose most consumers still think a tire is a tire is a tire. Is that the big challenge, trying to tell them that that's not so? Exactly, and also we have to uh, change the consumer's uh, aspect and thinking in that, uh, especially for winter tires, that big lug tires are a way to go. Uh, the way to go now is with small lug tires with a lot of sipes. So basically you want to stay on the snow and not dig yourself a hole into the snow. Well, we might as well stay in a winter mood. And standing by at the motoring garage right now is Bill Gardner. And Bill, when it comes to winter driving, should we be looking at getting a set of special tires, or is a fresh tread good enough? Well, Brad, we recommend for our customers, if they plan to be anywhere away from an urban area, that they consider buying four snow tires. Now, if you're around the city, uh, quite often the congestion and traffic that's involved keeps speeds down to a point where you really can't get into a whole lot of trouble. But uh, as soon as you get away from those urban areas, of course, you've got windswept roads drifting and a little bit higher speeds because you don't have that congestion. You can get yourself into some big time trouble. Now, if your car has these nice alloy wheels, a couple of problems that can occur by leaving them on all winter are, first of all, that you may get an unsightly corrosion blotch starting in one or more areas of that wheel, and it can really disfigure the looks of that wheel. Now, if you uh, clean these ones up in the fall and set them aside for next summer, put your winter snow tires and wheels on, you can potentially have a nice set of wheels like that for the entire life of the car and never have them disfigured. The other thing is the fact that uh, alloy wheels tend to leak air around the uh, rim flange to tire bead interface. This area right here tends to uh, leak air in the winter time. Low temperatures, it's a difficult area to seal, especially after a bit of salt and corrosion gets into that area. You don't have nearly that much problem with steel wheels and winter tires. The other thing is the fact that these rims are very expensive and if you slide sideways into a curb and bang one of these, you're looking at several hundred dollars just for the rim alone. The other, the other thing to consider is the fact that all the suspension components are very expensive on today's cars and you're sure to bend one of those if you slide into a curb as well. 
So that seven or eight hundred dollars that you might be thinking about spending on winter tires and wheels looks pretty small uh, in comparison to replacing some of these parts and maybe having to do a frame pull, a realignment, etc. And you've compromised the uh, long-term viability of your car if you have a collision like that. So balance out those costs against the, the potential uh, results of, uh, of sliding off the road into some object. Now, uh, what we do normally is that we, we scour the wreckers and look for used wheels and tires. Now, these 13-inch steel wheels that fit the Honda that we've got on the hoist here today are $25 to $40 neighborhood per, per wheel used at a wreckers. And uh, they could be quite rusty when you get them, but you take them home, clean them up with some sandpaper, primer them and paint them and they can look just as good as new. Mount your tires on them, inflate them, balance them and they're ready to go at a moment's notice. Now we've got this car on the hoist here today and we're using an air impact gun to remove the wheels quickly but that's not at all necessary. You can do this quite easily. It's a, an easy Saturday morning do-it-yourself or project with the jack that comes supplied with the car and a four-way wheel wrench. You can change all four of those tires if they're mounted and ready to go on rims in 15 to 20 minutes and you'll save yourself a lot of money as well. The other thing that's nice about that, uh, th that package is the fact that you can install them and remove them at a moment's notice without having to book appointments with service people. Now I do suggest that if you're putting together a winter tire and wheel package that you consult a tire dealer. They're specialists in recommending the different uh, rim widths and tire diameters that may be uh, necessary when you switch over to four winter tires. So consult with a tire dealer and he'll set you up with a proper package. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 95. Test Drive with Graham Fletcher. This week on Test Drive, we look at the second generation of Subaru's very popular legacy. Now, when this vehicle was released in Japan, it became the hottest selling car in Tokyo. Does this version have the potential to do the same in Canada? We'll have the answer for you at the end of this week's test drive. Subaru are one of the few car companies to offer all-wheel drive in all of their models. The wrinkle in this year's model lineup is the availability of traction control on the front-wheel drive model. This option allows Subaru to cover all the bases. Under the hood is a 2.2-litre 16-valve horizontally opposed flat-4 boxer engine. To compensate for the loss of the turbo model, this motor has been reworked to provide better performance in the normal operating range. Power is rated at 135 horsepower and 140 pounds-feet of torque. Compared to last year's model, everything is improved. You not only get more power in the usable range, you also get better fuel economy. The truly sad part in all of this is that we in North America will not see the turbocharged version of this engine. I say sad because the 250 horse twin turbo version of this motor recently set the record as the fastest production station wagon in the world. As they say, pity. One of the aspects of Subaru design that I've always admired is the underhood layout. Because they've adopted the flat four boxer engine, it's allowed them to put all the service components right up front. Power steering pump, alternator, air conditioning, the starter motor's right there. These wires lead you straight down to the spark plugs and even the belts at the front are easy to change. And when it's all that easy, it makes the mechanic's life very easy, which makes your labor bill that much smaller. Everybody benefits. Match with this engine is a five-speed manual gearbox. This unit features a very handy gadget called the hill holder. To engage, the driver depresses the brake pedal while simultaneously depressing the clutch. Once done, the brakes hold the car, preventing any rollback. The all-wheel drive system that comes with the manual box features a center viscous coupling which works like a limited slip differential to continuously deliver power to the wheels with the best traction. The system comes into its own in wet or wintry conditions. The degree of stability and control it imparts has to be experienced to be believed. During the pylon test, some high-speed cornering on wet tarmac proved to be a cakewalk. If you go with the automatic transmission, the all-wheel drive setup differs slightly in as much as it's an active system. A special set of clutch plates that are controlled electronically determine the torque split front to rear. It is a very impressive design. 
Now the penalty you pay for going with the all-wheel drive model is a drop in fuel economy of about 3 to 5 percent, a small price to pay when you consider the safety aspect. For the record, we average 23 miles per gallon or 12.3 litres per 100 kilometres. The suspension is comprised of McPherson struts at all four corners and is fully independent with anti-roll bars both back and front. During the test, the car handled very well. This is due in part to the fact that the rear suspension is designed to allow small amounts of towing during hard cornering. The result is a stable, sure-footed feel. The nice part is that the handling characteristics have been achieved without sacrificing anything in the way of ride comfort. The power steering is speed sensitive, meaning that you get plenty of assist during parking maneuvers as well as good feedback at high speeds. Our tester featured the optional four-channel anti-lock brake system. During the brake test I required just 117 feet to stop from 80k. The pedal feel is good and the system allows a little bit of latitude before the ABS intervenes. All in all, a very nice setup. When Subaru redesigned this Legacy, they stuck an extra two inches into the wheelbase, which in turn equates to a lot more legroom for the rear seat passengers. In doing that, they turned the car that was on the tight side into one that's very roomy, given its overall dimensions. Inside, the Legacy is tastefully finished, with a lot of emphasis being placed on ergonomics. As with their other models, Subaru engineers have placed all the major driver controls as high up as possible. This means that they are placed within your usual line of sight. The exception to the rule is the radio. It sits a long way down and if you use the coffee cup holder it blocks off most of the controls. Elsewhere the seats provide a high degree of comfort despite the fact that the base is on the short side. The trunk is roomy, offers a nice low lift over and the 60-40 split folding rear seats provide versatility. The nice part about the seats is that they can be locked in the upright position which improves trunk security. On the safety front, the Legacy is a hit, featuring dual airbags, adjustable upper seatbelt anchors and childproof door locks, plus the optional ABS and all-wheel drive. Subaru have done a very good job with this second generation Legacy. It's roomy, it's comfortable, it handles, the all-wheel drive option is a godsend in winter. The drawback? While 135 horsepower is not to be sneezed at, it's not enough for this car. However, the good news, there's a 2.5 litre engine coming soon which should address that shortcoming. Our Midas tip of the week concerns proper sizing of your winter tire wheel package. Earlier in this show we talked about the importance of having four winter tires for your vehicle. Now we want to compare that size and you can see quite easily with these two tires that fit the same vehicle, our winter tire is much narrower than this high performance all season we've been using in the summer. Now, the, the main advantage of that is twofold. First of all, uh, the narrower snow tire is going to cut down through the slush and snow and get to that traction so that we can get the vehicle moving in the first place without getting stuck. Second of all, when we're at speed on the highway and you change lanes, I'm sure you've all encountered the car slewing alternately left and right as you go through that standing slush and snow. And by going to a narrower tire wheel package, you will somewhat reduce that tendency, making the car easier to control at speed. Now, when we turn these wheels and tires around, you can see the difference in rim diameter. This aluminum rim is a 14-inch diameter, and the steel wheel we're using for the winter is 13. Now, what we've done is we've carefully matched the outside diameter of the tires so that clearance isn't a problem and that we keep the same gearing and speedometer uh, error is kept to a minimum on our vehicle. And that's very important. So when you're sizing those winter tires and wheels, first of all, Find out the outside diameter of the original tire wheel package on your car and try and match your snows as closely as possible to that outside diameter. But in most cases, you want to go down at least one size in width in order to get that narrower tire for just those things that we mentioned earlier. Better traction and cutting through that slush and snow. That's your Midas tip of the week. Off-Road Corner with Cam McRae. Brought to you by Land Rover, makers of Range Rover, Discovery, and Defender. With each segment of Off-Road Corner, we're going to bring you some tips and techniques to help you go off-roading safely, enjoyably, and with a minimum of environmental impact. Before we ever go off-road, we have to get you properly situated behind the controls. Take the steering wheel, for example. Most folks I observe handle this thing very badly. 
They straight arm it. They limp wrist it. The proper way to handle it, put your hands at nine o'clock, three o'clock, lots of motion, full range of motion. On the highway, a light grip, thumbs inside the wheel. Off the road, we grip it a little more firmly and we make sure that those thumbs never go inside the spokes. If a front tire hit an obstacle, that shock can come right up through the steering column and give you a sharp jar. That can hurt. Okay, let's work on driver position. Use your seat slider to move the seat forward as far as it can go and you still feel comfortable with the way your feet fit the pedals. Then use the seat back brake to bring you up so that you've got a nice, comfortable, bent arm driving position. Lots of re leverage, lots of reaction time. Hands at nine o'clock, three o'clock, thumbs outside of the steering wheel. Now you may find this a little cozy, but get used to it. Take a look at those NASCAR drivers. This is exactly the way that they do it. Now when you're driving down the trail, keep your eyes high. Look a long way down, sweeping from side to side, checking for obstacles. We call them challenges. There's an added benefit of sitting this close to the steering wheel. You're also sitting really close to the front of the hood. You have to meet one of those challenges. I've got a great sight line right down in front of the vehicle where I can see what I'm doing. Oh yeah, by the way, always wear the seat belt. And finally, our Land Rover Cred Lightly Tip of the Week. Always drive on established trails. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. Viewers in Southern Ontario will recognize this van. For those of you visiting Southern Ontario, a word of warning, this is the kind of van the Ontario Provincial Police are using for photo radar. Now, I don't want you to think I'm obsessed with photo radar, but it really bugs me that the government is using photo radar as a blatant tax grab while veiling it under the thin disguise of safety. Now, I pulled in behind a photo radar van the other day to have a chat with the officer on duty. I asked him how the photo hut business was doing. Maybe not the best opening line to a guy who's wearing a gun. Still, he said, we're only here catching the idiots, pointing to the machine, which was set at 120 kilometers an hour. Oh, I see. At 119 kilometers an hour, you're not an idiot. At 121, you become an idiot. Meanwhile, he's parked about five feet away from three lanes of high-speed traffic, and we're the idiots? And I asked him if he was going to help out a disabled vehicle I'd spotted a few kilometers down the road. Hood was up. Driver was peering into the engine compartment. That's not my responsibility, he said. I thought that was a strange grasp of priorities, given that five people had been killed when their parked car had been slammed into by a drunk driver on a photo radar patrolled highway, I should add. Still, he said, if you want a reporter, why don't you phone the office? I screamed at him, don't you have a radio on that truck? But his window was already rolling up. Got to keep those cameras loaded and keep that cash rolling in. How do these people sleep at night? I'm Jim Kent. Well, we're about to wrap things up here on a beautiful afternoon in Old Montreal. Now, if you happen to be a driver who gets a little concerned when you see one of those big tractor trailers getting a touch close to you on the highway, tune in next week because we may show you that you have good reason to be nervous. That and much more as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. TSN's Motoring 95 has been brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State the intelligent oil for longer engine life, and Midas for brake, exhaust, suspension, and steering service. Trust your car to Midas.